this is the Seminole Wars Authority. Hello and welcome. In the Second Seminole War, probably every soldier complained about the hostile Florida climate, but only a few ever did anything about it. In this episode, Professor Jacob Hagstrom of the Citadel joins us to discuss the climate of operations in that Second Seminole War. Jacob examines disputed overall casualty figures for the Army for both combat and disease whether the climate was uniquely inhospitable, and whether it was indeed so hostile that the Army could not successfully remove the Seminole from Florida. Regardless, relief came from unlikely circumstances, driven not from the top down, but from the bottom up, as military tinkerers and innovators seized the day. To increase soldier mobility or to slow down Seminole escape, Gabriel Rains fashioned landmines. John Lane fashioned rubber pontoon bridges so soldiers could more easily cross streams and rivers. And Hezekiah Thistle fashioned a saddle that could aid in the evacuation of casualties who would ride comfortably in the prone position. This culture of innovation became so well known that it reached the consciousness of one Edgar Allan Poe, late of the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, who penned a satirical account, the man that was used up about service in Florida at the time. The Seminoles, meanwhile, innovated as well, switching from labor-intensive log cabins to easily constructed chickees, and they modified their diets to adapt to available produce in the Everglades. They also used the environment to take cover and to conceal themselves from advancing soldiers. Take a listen to learn how this all panned out. Jacob Hagstrom, welcome to the Seminole Wars Authority. Thanks, Patrick. I'm really happy to be on here. And we're glad to have you. So, Jacob, you've got the lead article in the current Florida Historical Quarterly, Volume 100, Winter 2022, Number 3. Tell us the title, what it's about, and why it's important. The title of the paper is The Nature of Their Country, and it comes from a quote from General Zachary Taylor. I knew I wanted to write something about the environment because I've found that a lot of the older historical works about the Seminole War seem to pit the environment as a discouraging agent, as something that prevented the Americans from removing the Seminoles perhaps uh, as completely or as quickly as they might have. Uh, and yet the more that I did research about the war and the people involved, the more I found that the environment also had another type of agency, which was to encourage innovation. And so that's what I wrote the paper about. Did no one choose this as a topic previously? From what I read in the article, it sounds like you've done some innovative work here. It's a good question. I think there were a lot of people, again, who had written about how difficult the environment was. And there's definitely a lot of sources that speak to that. But I wanted to try to come at it from a different perspective. You know, I think a lot of people, again, they're trying to explain why it took so long for the Seminoles to be removed and why some of them, a very few of them, weren't removed at the end of the Seven Year War, or even at the end of the Third Seminole War. Um, but it doesn't, that kind of discouraging agency doesn't really explain why over 95% of the Seminoles were either removed or were victims of the military campaigns. What was the state of Florida's climate and nature at the start of the Second Seminole War? I think it's important for your listeners to remember that Florida in 1835 was still a U.S. territory. It doesn't become a state until 1845. Previously, it had been a Spanish territory. Before that, it had been a British territory. And before that, a Spanish territory. Again, the common thread with all of these states is that their subjects or citizens did very little settling. It's pretty hard to imagine today because Florida is so populous. It's like the third most populous state, over 20 million people. But in 1830, there were less than 35,000 white people and then mostly enslaved African Americans they brought with them. So less than 35,000. Even in 1840, about 54,000. Most of them settled on the northern border area of Florida, kind of from Tallahassee to Jacksonville or St. Augustine. And so it's very little settled. You can kind of compare by 1840, Michigan, which becomes a state around the same time, has 212,000. So compared to that 54, it's quite a difference. 
Most of the interior of Florida is unexplored by white people. They didn't really understand where the Everglades even were. You can see from the military maps they're using at the beginning of the conflict. So little settled, relatively unexplored, and also dominated by water. So not only the marshes that Florida is still famous for, but also a variety of streams and lakes throughout the territory. Was it true that the Americans who were coming into Florida were more susceptible to disease and the climate than the Seminoles? The Americans who arrive in Florida definitely get sick because of the climate, because it's so hot, and also because of the unique disease ecology there. I'm not sure if the Seminoles actually do a better job in terms of disease and thriving. Because of the lack of sources, it's kind of tough to tell. But the United States agents who show up definitely thought that the Indians are better adapted to Florida than they are. So that's something that does come through in the sources. How did the Seminoles frustrate the Army's efforts at removal by using terrain and environment and climate to their advantage? I think a good example of how the Seminoles use landscape to frustrate the Army is at the Battle of Lake Okeechobee. So first of all, they set up their defenses in front of a large marsh so that the army would have to plod through in order to get them and bring them to battle. The second way they used the environment was to send observers up into trees. That way they could signal to the people down below when the Americans, and this is Zachary Taylor, and mostly the 6th Infantry, but he's got some volunteers with him, so that the Seminoles can wait until they see the whites of their eyes, essentially, and wait and hold their fire until it'll be most effective. And then the third way at Lake Okeechobee that the Seminoles use the environment to their advantage is they set up with their backs to the Everglades. So it's an easy way to escape when it suited them. This goes to a broader point about the Seminole strategy in general. They try to avoid battle unless they have advantageous conditions, and they definitely select good ones at Lake Okeechobee. In trying to understand this, why were the regular soldiers who were sent to Florida so poorly capable to handle the environment? They complained a lot about what they found, the natural conditions they found in Florida. But my article argues they actually did a better job of adapting over time than other historians have said they did. And I think maybe there's something about the sources that explains this, because a lot of what you get are criticisms of the regular soldiers And so sometimes that's coming from the militia. So they want to say the regular army is ill-equipped to deal with this because they're mostly city boys from up north. You need the militia to be able to deal with the Seminoles in this unique environment. It's a political statement wrapped up in that criticism. And then also within the army, you also have the politics of different commanders trying to buy for the top spot. So I think that has a lot to do with why Winfield Scott is so heavily criticized at the beginning of the Florida war, because his plans don't seem to be suited to the terrain. And he gets a lot of criticism from his peers for that within the regular army. A lot of it has to do with the expectations of the time. And at the time, they didn't have a lot of this knowledge about germ theory. So perhaps historians have been reading some of these criticisms backwards through their present lens and saying, how could they have known about this without really understanding the context of medicine in the United States in the 19th century? We have this perception, though. What did Zachary Taylor say about the environment? It's important to note the context of the source. He's writing to the adjutant general in Washington, D.C., who has written Zachary Taylor, the commander, a letter in Florida saying, what's the deal? Why haven't you gotten rid of all these Seminoles yet? There's only 5,000 of them. You've got a good army down there to support you. What's the deal? And so Taylor is excusing his own lack of success thus far in the campaign. And so he's saying it's the nature of their country. It's not the failures of the United States. It's because, first of all, they can conceal themselves in this vegetation, the swamps and the hammocks that Florida is famous for. The other reason the nature of their country has made Taylor fail is because of the climate, because it's so hot, because disease spreads seemingly so well there. And then thirdly, he says that the country where, quote, no tracks are left when he flies. And so this is, again, referenced back to that marshy or watery terrain that Floridians probably still recognize to this day. Hard to track people in this. I wanted to have a quote to lead off the title, and I thought this was a good one. What do we have the Army's nemesis, Koakuchi, saying about nature and the environment? It's interesting because he's also explaining the reason why he's surrendering. He's one of the last 
groups and leaders of a group of resisting indigenous people to surrender, he says, quote, the white men are as thick as the leaves in the hammock. They come upon us thicker every year. That's kind of contradicting what I said at the beginning about the lack of population in Florida, right? And it's true, right? All these American settlers who are moving tend to migrate to northern states. They tend to migrate west rather than southeast into Florida. But from Coacucci's perspective, he's saying the Americans are moving in. There are too many white people. But he uses this analogy with the terrain. And that's why I wanted to include that, because it's, again, this kind of excuse for military failure. For Coacucci, it's not literal, but it's a metaphor of uh, nature provides his reason. How did the U.S. Army use the environment as a scapegoat for their military failures? I think that scapegoat is an excellent word for this. It's a biblical reference, right, of trying to put all your problems onto this thing and then cast it out. And this is exactly what the American commanders do. They're trying to explain their failure. This doesn't necessarily reflect reality, certainly doesn't reflect the trend over time for the army, because as I said, eventually they do succeed in their goal of removing most of the Seminoles. The nature is something that they complain about and something that they assign as a reason for their failure at times. The Florida environment led many soldiers into desperation and despair, but it also led soldiers to innovate, to try to adapt to this environment. Tell us about that. That's a great question, and it gets to the heart of the argument of the paper, because, again, you can find a lot of sources of soldiers complaining about the terrain and and the conditions there. And I would say that that's pretty typical of most wars in most places. Soldiers like to complain about stuff. We like to say, if the troops ain't complaining, then the troops ain't training. Exactly. We know these soldiers are going to complain. That's kind of the typical reaction. But so what I was interested in was this idea that necessity is the mother of invention, that they do initially say this is going to be a big obstacle, but eventually some people will try to overcome that obstacle. Some people are just going to get stuck and quit. But I started finding in this research all these different examples of inventions, some of them pretty commonplace, and some of them were things that the Army had already been doing before. But the most noteworthy were new mechanical innovations, and sometimes by fairly low-ranking soldiers, junior officers for the most part. So that's what I found fascinating, and that's what I thought had not been emphasized enough in the historical literature that exists already. What are some examples? Some examples of the environment serving as pushing the Americans to invent things I would separate this into three different categories, ways that they could become more mobile, either on land, over water, or away from airborne illnesses. So on land, the Americans develop more cavalry units. It's dragoons at the time, but they want horse-mounted units to be more mobile. They also, another, this is something that they had been doing before, is building roads but they increased that effort in Florida. And the most noteworthy invention for overland, trying to diminish the Seminoles' mobility over land, is that Captain Gabriel Rains invents an improvised explosive device. Over water, the most significant invention is a new pontoon bridge that's created by Captain John Lane. And then away from illness, the big one is Hezekiah Thistle's saddle to evacuate casualties. They each addressed a specific need. Cavalry, dragoons, roads, IEDs, bridges, saddles. To increase their own mobility, the Seminoles had to innovate as well. I think it's important to note that the Seminoles were interested in increasing their mobility. And a lot of times what the Americans are doing with these inventions is trying to eliminate what we would call maybe today a mobility gap. It's not a missile gap like we have in the 20th century. This is a mobility gap with indigenous people that the Americans are trying to remove. The Seminoles, they did adjust. Instead of hunting, they're adjusting to hiding in Florida. So what they do, though, is they adjust their dwelling spaces. Before the war, they had lived mostly in log cabins, and they shift to the Chiki, which Floridians will know of today, but that was an innovation during the Second Seminole War period. And the other thing that the Seminoles do and other indigenous people in Florida is to adjust the food sources that they used. So prior to this war of Indian removal, They had been developing their agriculture, and they had been noteworthy cattle herders. Well, those are really easy targets for the Americans. So in order to hide better and still eat well, 
they developed different ways of sourcing their food. So for starch, they collected up the kunti root, the arrow root, and made that into a starchy substance. And then there's plenty of fish, again, because Florida is such a watery terrain, all these rivers and lakes, it was easier for them to gather up fish, sometimes alligators, perhaps. Again, the sources aren't exactly clear, but they're going from a farming diet to a foraging diet. Why do you think so few historians have approached these aspects of the Seminole War, such as the environment? I don't know. That's a really good question. It's a little bit puzzling to me because we do have examples of some very early military historians who emphasize the environment, how important it is. Mostly they're talking about terrain and geography. But I was reading in Clausewitz, who was writing in the early 19th century. I saw you had an episode about Clausewitz before, so maybe your readers are familiar. And then also Hans Delbruck, too, in, in the early 20th century. Both of these are giants of military history, and both of them emphasize the effects of the terrain on warfare. I think the newer angle is for people to shift their thinking again and say, what is the effect of war on the environment? So as opposed to what is the environment's effect on war, what is the effect of war on the environment? And that's where most of the environmental historians are coming from. Part of this is just that history as a discipline can still tend to be quite siloed. So you have environmental historians working on one hand, you have military historians working on the other, and it's hard for them to come together and analyze things in the same terms. Maybe the other reason, too, I'm just kind of spitballing here, but maybe it's easier for historians to write about people. When we think about agency, it's much easier for us to understand the agency of an individual with a personality. So I wanted to think about the environment as an agent of change in itself. And in some ways, I'm really just following a trend that's taking place in military history, but has mostly been written about in the context of the Civil War. And it's not that surprising because the Civil War is so much more popular in our historical memory and for historians. So I think that we will see in the future this trend of environmental history being integrated into some of the less studied wars, like the wars of Indian removal to include the Second Seminole War. Historians can't stay inside the academy. In cases such as this, they need to get out to walk the terrain in the type of climate that the soldiers were experiencing at that time of year great comment about actually walking the battlefield and trying to understand the conditions that the soldiers did. That's something that it might as well be right out of Delbruck. Hans Delbruck makes that exact comment where he says military historians should walk the battlefields because otherwise there's no way to understand what took place there. And it certainly jogs with my experience in the military too. How could you explain the war in Afghanistan without understanding the terrain of Afghanistan? It's impossible. So I think I probably brought that into my studies as well. What is the problem with trying to experience the climate and environment as it really was? If you really did make it realistic, no one would want to do it. <laughs> you know, and my, uh, I just was talking to my brother who went to this virtual reality Dan Carlin thing at the World War One Museum. Have you heard about that? It was so funny because his comment from it was, you're going through the trenches in World War I. And his comment on coming out of it was, that was so cool. And I was thinking, that was probably not the experience of the soldiers who went through it. But on the other hand, you want to create this thing where tourists do want to go and experience. So it's this dilemma where how accurate do you make it? Because at a certain point, if you make it accurate, the water in the bottom of the trench and the rats, no one is going to want to do it. Why was Florida's environment so much more challenging than the one that Georgians or Alabamans or South Carolinians suffered from? I'm not sure that it was. Again, you do get more soldiers complaining about it just because there are more there. And again, they're trying to explain their failure. But I think one of the big differences that I alluded to earlier was that it's less settled than these other states. So Florida, even by 1840, has about 50 or 50,000 white people and the enslaved people that they bring with them. Georgia has 500,000. Alabama has 300,000. So in these places, it's much more difficult for indigenous people to hide and to find a place to get away from the settlers who would provide intelligence, if not actively go out and form militias and hunt them down, which they are doing in Florida. The other thing that's maybe unique about Florida's terrain or its position geographically is its proximity to Cuba and to the Bahamas. 
again, it's really unclear from the sources, but certainly the Americans are afraid that these Seminoles are not only getting supplies in from Cuba and the Bahamas, but perhaps they're escaping there too when they need to. Well, certainly soldiers and officers thought the Florida environment was more challenging than that in Georgia and Alabama. So what did the Army Medical Department say when they were asked to look at it? Yeah, this is fascinating. Your question is about the medical corps. They come out with a new report that's saying, is Florida more sickly than anywhere else? Again, this is something that historians have said that Florida presents this unique disease ecology, and perhaps it does. But Samuel Forey, who's the surgeon who is compiling all these statistics, he's collecting up the sick list, the mortality list from the various outposts, and he does it by quarter of a year. They're possibly doctored statistics, doctored tease upon here, but they might, again, be made to make the medical corps look better. This would be pretty impressive if you say we've got this campaign going on and the medical corps is able to treat the soldiers and keep them as at least as healthy as the rest of the stations in the South. There are extremely high sickness rates and mortality rates in other places, especially farther west in Louisiana and in Arkansas, too. You'll find really sick soldiers there as well. And so you're right. They go back and forth. The leadership essentially isn't sure what to do, and they go back and forth as to whether or not to station soldiers in the interior forts during the sickly summer months. Flory also, interestingly, in this text, he speculates that Well, if there are high numbers of illness in Florida, it's not really due to the climate. It's certainly not due to the surgeons and the medical personnel not treating them well. It might be due to increased alcohol consumption. And you can also find evidence of that in soldiers' sources, that they are consuming quite a bit of alcohol. And so maybe that has something to do with it, too. One might almost think they came up with this so they could justify summer campaigns in Florida. I think if you want to do summer campaigning, if you think that's what's going to finally get the remaining Seminoles to emigrate, perhaps you put some pressure. Although I think that this report, again, the last statistics are from 1839. So that predates Worth's summer campaigns. But I think you're right to suggest that these statistics are possibly, again, motivated by some kind of internal politics within the army. Why was it so hard to assess the impact of disease among those who were fighting the Florida War? It's really difficult because we have limited statistics, and the best statistics that we have are compiled by the Army, which has its own interests. So we don't have any real way to verify whether Flory's statistics were correct or not, unless we try to go back and do it from those reports themselves, which I don't think those exist anymore the individual outpost reports of the soldiers. That would be really fascinating to try to do a fine-grained study, but I don't know where that would be. In that era, how much did poor sanitary practices contribute to the spread of disease among the troops? It's important, again, when we were talking about disease, to distinguish between some of the things that might have been exceptional in Florida, unique to Florida, and those would be the fevers, especially the malarial fevers that became endemic. But you also have these what we might call crowd diseases or camp diseases that are caused by poor sanitation. And these are the ones, in fact, which the indigenous people will suffer from worse than the newcomer Americans. And again, it has to do with building up immunities. What were seminal practices to avoid contracting diseases in a disease prone environment? Was it avoiding dicey areas? Was it building up immunities? Was it the way they dressed? I'm not sure about the way they dress, but I do think the reasons why the Seminoles tend, or at least from the Americans' perspective, they tend to avoid the fever so much is because they have built up immunities over previous seasons, perhaps even previous generations. And then knowing the knowledge of the terrain to avoid, this is a place where there's standing water. They don't put that together that that means standing water means mosquitoes, means malaria, but they know to avoid that water in a similar way, perhaps that the Americans think of standing water creates a noxious gas, some kind of miasma that's going to make them sick. So they don't really understand this, but I think they do learn the hard way by the school of hard knocks to avoid these places. But yeah, it's, it's good to differentiate the types of disease. And I think sanitation plays a large role in the Seminoles when they are imprisoned uh, and on their way and certainly 
during their process of removal are subject to these diseases of crowd and camp. How did some Seminoles ward off removal by stating, frankly, they were sick? That's a great point to make. I forgot to include that in the earlier explanation, but a lot of the Americans you can see, especially in a letter from Colonel Harney to General Jessup, he is explaining then why Seminoles didn't meet with him and the excuse that they gave was that they were sick. And it's unclear as to whether they were actually sick or whether they just thought that that would be something that Harney would be likely to believe as a white person. He is anxious about getting sick in Florida. They're certainly smart to avoid talking to Colonel Harney, as your uh, listeners probably know. That was a good idea by that point. How do we account for different estimates of casualties overall in the Florida war? This is leading into 42. There's a difference between the 1840 report by Samuel Forey, published under the name of his boss, Lawson, who's a Surgeon General at the time. But there's a discrepancy between that and between what C.S. Monaco writes about in his excellent book about the limits of American aggression. And this is where I think I'm verging into dangerous territory here because historians doing math, anything could happen. But I think there might be some... I encourage your listeners actually to check my math on this. But what Monaco, the recent historian, says in his book is that there's over 10% of all soldiers who served in Florida died of disease. That's pretty remarkable. Samuel Forey, on the other hand, the guy who was actually there on the ground, the surgeon says it's about 5% or about half that. So I was trying to figure out what could be the reason. And again, so... Monaco will say, well, Forey is reducing intentionally. He's doctoring these numbers to try to get lower numbers. When I looked at the equation that Monaco used to get this 10% of soldiers, they're in Florida, they die of disease. It has to do with the denominator. So I'm actually not disputing the number of soldiers who die of sickness. Both Forey and Monaco, ultimately, you can look back for the totals at the appendix that's in John Sprague's book the origin, progress, and conclusion of the Florida War. So that the top number of the number who are dead from disease, that doesn't change. What I think changes is the denominator. How many total soldiers, regular soldiers served in Florida? And I found that Monaco used the figure from John K. Mahan's book, which is 10,169. That's a very precise number. And so I'm trying to figure out how Mahan and then Monaco get this number. And I, with some rough math, I believe that they just totaled up all of the units that served in Florida. And the reason why that's unrealistic is because these units are not monoliths. They are not just blocks that go into Florida all at once and then come out all at once. The analogy or the metaphor that I use here is each regiment or each unit is like Theseus's ship. So it goes out in one way. Every single piece is basically replaced by the time it comes back. You've got private soldiers shuffling in and out of the unit every month. So even at a fairly low rate of replacement, if you just have a couple soldiers each month that come in and out, it'll probably be about double than the total number that serve in Florida. So that's what I think that, that Forey is probably closer to the truth than Monaco is. Besides rotation because of casualties, enlistments run out, and those soldiers must be replaced. Yeah, seven years worth. That's another good point to make, that from 1833 to 38, so for most of the war, Army contracts are only three years, and there are many regiments that are stationed there for three years or more. So you've got to figure, you've also got people not only being replaced because they're sick or running away or deserting, but you just got people every month that that's the end of their enlistment term and they're just going to leave and, and be replaced. The thing that actually tipped me off to this was looking at that appendix in Sprague's book of all the casualties and seeing out of roughly a thousand people who die, 10 of them are recruits who are not even assigned to a unit. So you can see just in that period, these are people who are on the way into the war and already dying before they're even in a unit. 10,000 served total, about 1,000 died. How did the Army go from a romantic and gloomy portrayal of service in Florida to one of innovation? The significance of this is it helps to explain the outcome, the sad, tragic outcome that most of the Seminoles are either killed or removed from Florida. Again, our estimates are bad because 
they are just estimates from the army officers who serve there, but there's probably not many more than 5,000 indigenous people in Florida at the beginning of the war. And somewhere around 4,000 of them are removed. By the end of the conflict, the American officers are estimating that there's only maybe 100 or 200 indigenous people left. So this idea of the environment doomed the American project seems to fall flat when you come to that realization. I think it also helps to explain the broader trend in American society, their obsession with science and technology. And it's something that we might not associate with this period before the Civil War. But I was inspired by great historian Daniel Howe, who wrote a book called What Hath God Wrought? This is the first message that's sent by telegraph what hath God wrought. And so it's all about the 1830s as a time of technology, not only the telegraph, but also the railroad. And Howe makes this argument, these two technologies are annihilating space and time, something that's mocked, in fact, by Edgar Allan Poe in one of his stories about the Seminole War, which is called The Man That Was Used Up. My next essay is about the stories that come out of the Second Seminole War and how infused they are by this American obsession with science and technology. I'm going to present it at the McNeil Center in November as part of their War Stories Conference. Edgar Allan Poe is a fascinating character because he served in the Army. He was at Fort Moultrie, which is the same place where Osceola died. He served there before the Seminole War, so he wasn't necessarily aware of Osceola while he was a soldier. But He has this experience. He had spent a semester at West Point. He met Winfield Scott at one point. And he's certainly aware of the Florida War as it's going on because it's in the news everywhere up and down the eastern seaboard. And what Poe does in his story of the Second Seminole War is fascinating because he has an enslaved character named Pompey included in early versions of the story. But the later versions of the story and the ones that become popular and get republished Poe has erased the character of Pompey from the story. So it goes from a story that's mocking the American dependence on enslaved laborers and goes to one that's mocking the American obsession with technology. And I think that's a really important thing for us to remember for, again, trying to get into the mindsets of the people who lived at that time. How did this spirit of innovation and invention infuse itself in a holistic fashion into the Army's operations? This is my argument, and this might be controversial, but that's what I'm trying to do is to put this framework onto all of these different fragments that I see. Historians have done a good job of analyzing these piecemeal, and what I'm saying is this represents more of a way of thinking for the army. I'm not sure if I would say it's quite a way of war, as Russell Likely might say, but in that direction of trying to uncover a military mentalité of it's not just being discouraged. All these different things are examples of how do we conquer nature with technology and with our bureaucracy and with our logistics. These are all manifestations of that same mindset. It's interesting that the technological inventions are just one piece of it. They're perhaps the most creative piece, but the military had already been doing these kinds of things with building roads, steamboats, or something, again, that other people are inventing, and then the military repurposes them. Joint operations with the Navy is an interesting one. Someone else wrote an article in the Florida Historical Quarterly that calls some document that's produced by uh, McLaughlin, I believe, some kind of doctrine. I wouldn't go that far as saying that the Army and Navy create a joint doctrine at this time, but they do cooperate with each other. And I think, again, that willingness to cooperate, that willingness to subsume their institutional identities speaks to the fact that the environment posed this obstacle, but that people were willing to work around it and to make some creative adaptations to it. So, Jacob, why did you select this topic? Did you have some previous knowledge or interest in the Seminole Wars? I did not have any previous knowledge or interest in the Seminole Wars. In fact, I considered myself a pretty good student of history, but when I showed up to graduate school, I didn't know about the Seminole Wars, certainly not in any detail. But what I came into graduate school with was some experience in Afghanistan, and I knew people had been talking about insurgency, And so I wanted to try to understand the history of American counterinsurgency campaigns uh, or asymmetric campaigns. Anytime that the United States as a government is fighting against a people, not another state military, 
And so I posed this to my advisor, Con Dirks, and he helpfully provided this excellent evocative source about Kuala Batu, which is all the way out in the Pacific. And it's this naval engagement that the Jackson administration calls a punitive campaign. And that really resonated with me and my service in Afghanistan, this idea of a punitive campaign against a people as opposed to a state. That's what got me going in this direction. This Kuala Batu punitive campaign also took place during the 1830s. And as soon as I got into the documents, Kuala Batu became a small footnote and the Second Seminole War just became a mountain of evidence. And so it was clear that was the direction that I had to go in. What I started doing with Kuala Batu was to try to look at some of the periodicals from the military at the time. And the big one was the Army and Navy Chronicle. I started reading the articles in the Army and Navy Chronicle looking for Kuala Batu. And so I do a keyword search, Kuala Batu, all the different spellings, all the different you know, people involved. And so I'd find an article in one column, and then I'd look at the rest of the page, and many of the other columns were talking about intelligence from Florida, the Florida war. And so I was saying, oh, okay, this has to be in here. And initially, I was going to do kind of both or have maybe a chapter about Koala Batu, and then another chapter about Florida, and then another chapter about Texas. But I just started finding so much about Florida, and specifically so much about this idea of military learning and military adaptation as related to the Second Seminole War and this project, this great tragic project of Indian removal that I decided to focus in that way. The Navy and Koala Batu are not part of my dissertation, but I think that's common that you kind of go in with one idea and then it turns out differently in the end. So what are some areas for future study? And you've alluded to this a little bit earlier. Poe and the memory of the Seminole War or the war stories that come out of the Seminole War are my focus right now. Previously, I published an article in the Journal of Military History that was about the French conquest of North Algeria. And that came from my dissertation by way of Philip Carney, who was an American cavalry officer who was sent to France to learn how to be a cavalry officer. And then also went to North Africa to observe how the French were dealing with their own conquest of indigenous people. That is another angle that came out of the dissertation, but I don't have any others at the moment that I'm working on. The war stories and the memory is the current focus. Jacob, why is it important for historians to study open questions or previously settled questions or so we thought? I would say that nothing is settled. Everything is always possible to refine, if not overturn, the previous understanding of history. My concept of history is that it's a debate without end, so we're never really going to come and land on any firm answer. That's what I see the role of the historians being. What do you hope this article does to help our audience understand this element of U.S. history and the U.S. Army? I hope that there's a little bit more appreciation for the military as a learning institution. And here I feel like I'm following in the footsteps of giants. So first of all, John K. Mahon, whose book about the Second Seminole War produced in the 1960s, argues that the Seminole War is a step in the progression for the U.S. Army from the War of 1812, which is a disaster, to the Mexican War, which the Army actually handles pretty well. So the idea is they must have been learning and getting better somehow in that period. And this train of thought is picked up really well by Samuel Watson, who writes about the Army during the 1830s and especially the 1830s as a professionalizing force. And so I see learning as part of that. It might be an unexpected angle because there is lots of anti-intellectualism in the military, And Colonel Harney would be a great example of that. But he is just one individual. And I think there's room to see the military as a learning institution. The other thing the article makes clear is that there's a lot of innovation coming from the bottom up. A lot of this is tinkering with equipment by relatively powerless people. And that's the reason why they're doing it, especially people like Lane and people like Gabriel Rains you see in their writings that they feel very powerless in Florida. And so they're trying to address this situation. This is not technology that's bestowed from on high by the powerful. It's developed by people who are looking to improve their situations on the ground. And so if we want to try to write history as it was, 
I think we have to start from the bottom up with these folks who are actually conducting the removal in Florida. With that observation, we're out of time. Jacob Hagstrom, thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars Authority. Thanks so much for having me, Patrick. It's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate what you're doing and uh, getting the word out about history and about Florida history specifically and indigenous people's history. I think it's super important, as you can probably tell from my article. This podcast is copyright 2022, the Seminole Wars Foundation, all rights reserved. Find us on the web at seminalwars.podbean.com or seminalwars.us. Front and back bumper music courtesy of the U.S. Navy Band.